All right, Jason, I just press record. We are live, my friend, and welcome to every single one of you watching this Impress and Play today. My name is Jimmy, and this is my podcast, Mind Over Matter. And I cannot tell you how awesome this is for me today, how much excitement. You can see it in my face, but you can't really feel it inside of me. Just, uh, you know, how awesome this is going to be to be able to have a decorated U.S. Navy SEAL and Jason Redman on our podcast today. And before I introduce Mr. Jason Redman, which is the reason why I know you're here, it's not because of me and to hear my rants. I want to talk to you a little bit about this channel because we're going to be moving strictly to YouTube. So everybody's doing it. I apologize. It'll only take a mi maybe a minute or less of your time, and then we're going to get rocking and rolling with the good stuff. But I started this podcast, Mind Over Matter, for two reasons a couple months ago. One, to help you enhance your mindset, and two, to help you work on weaknesses in your life because I have them, believe it or not. Jason has them, and I know each and every single one of us out there has them too. And to me in my life, and Jason, you can chime in on this if you don't agree with me, but the best way to attack weaknesses is to learn continually and just continue to fuel our minds with the proper, not only nutrition, but the proper fuel to be able to carry us about a stronger day and to be the best versions of ourselves. So I'm going to provide you interviews with military personnel like Jason. Also professional athletes. I had Josh Bell on from the Pittsburgh Pirates last week, who's an MLB all-star. Soon to have J.J. Barea on from the Dallas Mavericks and a lot of other professional athletes lined up. Doctors, lawyers, first responders, you name it. I've got it. I'm going to bring it to you. And that's what I'm committed to do, providing you a fun and exciting, interactive learning environment for you to be able to extract knowledge and apply it to your life. So that is my goal with all of that. What I'm going to say secondly, and before we get to my introduction with Jason, is how you get a part of that or follow that moving forward is you press the subscribe button below this video. It takes two seconds of your time. It comes at no charge to you whatsoever. No credit card number, nothing on the back end. And then you can follow and get notifications on that content moving forward. Your support is what fuels this entire thing. More interviews to come. And then all of our content is strictly going to be moving to YouTube. We are on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, but right now until we at least hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, we're going to keep it strictly YouTube. So if you want the auditory stuff to come back, you got to press subscribe. That's it. It's free. It's quick. It's easy. It's fun. And we're going to have a lot more stuff. Great content moving forward as this platform continues to grow. So that's it. Now what I want to do, I want to introduce this awesome guy, Jason Redman, who's on the Zoom call with me today. But Really quickly, Jason, I'm glad that you are sitting across from me on a Zoom call and not in person because if I say something stupid or mess up, I know you could kill me with your two hands. So I'm glad that I at least have a little bit of distance between you and I to get a head start away from you, even though you're probably going to track me and hunt me down anyway. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Jason Redman. Uh, he is, was awarded the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart and a numerous amount of accolades as well. He's also been on Fox News, CBS, and CNN uh, talking about his experiences as a SEAL, which he'll talk about with you today. Jason grew up in a small town in Ohio, and then flashing forward a little bit, a couple years, he joined the Navy on September 11th, 1992. Uh, he spent two years in the Navy as an intelligence specialist, and then he was accepted into the BUDS program. And then, Jason, we'll talk about this a little bit later because I loved on your website about the, the reference that you gave about your experience in the BUDS class. But, but Jason graduated from class 202 in 1995 from BUDS. And then he spent the next couple of years in the teams and deployments to South America. He conducted numerous counter drug missions in Colombia and Peru. And flashing forward just a little bit after his couple of years since 1995, in August of 2000, he was one of 50 naval enlisted selected seamen to admiral for the, or the for, excuse me, one of the, uh, one of 50 naval enlisted selected men for seamen to admiral program. He graduated with a bachelor's of science in business management, summa cum laude. So this guy's pretty smart. He's not just jacked. And then he, he was commissioned as a Navy SEAL officer in 2004. After that, in 2005, July 2005, he was, uh, they were deployed to Afghanistan where he was the assistant uh, platoon commander. And then in 2007, two years flashing forward ahead of that, he was acting as an assault force commander to capture a HVT or a high value target Al-Qaeda uh, Al where he was, really that experience almost took your life, Jason, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but he, you know, he was shot eight times, twice in the arm, one in the face. Uh, he had to have 37 reconstructive surgeries uh, and it's just a miracle that he was able to survive and let alone get out of that sticky situation that they were in. They were able to, you know, be versatile. They fought valiantly and overcome and adapted and got themselves out of the fight successfully. And then after that, 
Uh, later on, he gained national recognition by an awesome red, or excuse me, not red, an orange letter that he posted on his door uh, that gained recognition from George Bush, and he got to spend some time with him in the Oval Office, uh, where he was awarded some other accolades as well. Really cool note that I can't wait to share with you here in a little bit. 2010, uh, he also fought, while he was still recovering from his battle wounds, he also funded Wounded Wear, which inspires combat warriors to adapt and overcome their mindsets, which I know is really important to Jason. And then in 2013, he retired after 21 years of service. He launched SOF Spoken LLC, an inspiration on leadership, teamwork, and overcoming adversity for first responders, sports team, and government organizations. He then went on to write a New York Times bestselling book, The Trident, which I can see right behind him on the Zoom call. I own it. You should own it too. It's awesome. Lots of value in that book. And then moving forward, Jason is also created a Get Off the X, which provides speakings, workshops, online programs, executive coaching, and business consulting for everybody around the world. So this guy, just from top to bottom, is a stellar individual, and it's such a privilege and an honor to have him on today. So Jason, long-winded, but thanks for joining me, my friend. Jimmy, honor to be on. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the great intro. Yeah, you're very welcome, sir. And I, like I said, I had a little bit of knowledge about you before. Um, I loved reading your book. It was awesome. And then obviously with your, uh, there was a documentary on YouTube or a documentary series on the History Channel, Warfighters, uh, where you talked about the Battle of Fallujah, which we'll talk about here in a little bit as well, which is awesome. So lots of ways that people can get connected with you and learn about you if they haven't already. But Jason, last night, my friend, I'll be honest, I don't get nervous easy. I was twisting, I was turning, I was tossing, I was freaking out. I was like, man, what? Am I? there's so much to talk about and so many starting points for this guy. But I want to talk to, I, I finally came up with a solution. And that solution was the topic of Memorial Day. And yesterday was Memorial Day on Monday. And then ironically enough, I'm here with a decorated U.S. Navy SEAL talking to you today, which is just awesome. That's a, I, we didn't plan it like that, but it wound up like that. So my first question to you to kick us off, to jumpstart us on this awesome podcast, Jason, is what does it mean? What does the flag mean to you? Or what does it mean, especially as someone who served at the highest of levels and represented the country? What does the red, white, and blue flag mean to you? Well, it means freedom and opportunity. And I think those are the two things that make America into what it is. And, uh, you know, if you look at that and you look at what built this country into what it was, I mean, truly, those were the things that motivated people to come to this country. I mean, there was risks. I mean, you look at America truly as a melting pot. So it's, it's frustrating to me watch the amount of division we have in our country and we have a lot of individuals who are, um, I don't know, there's just this slippery slide and this idea that America isn't as great as it once was and people will not want to hang on to their own individual demographics or where they came from instead of the foundations of what this country was about, where people came here with this idea of, hey, if I work hard enough, uh, I can achieve greatness. Uh, you know, I can... I can celebrate my religion in this country because there's religious freedoms and I can voice my mind against a, a um, government because we have political freedoms and all these things that made our country into what it is today. And, and, and that continues, but um, sometimes I wonder if some people take it for granted and they're mm -hmm. willing to easily uh, let those things go. There's this pervading sense that socialism is the answer in our country. Um, and having traveled all over the world and been in both socialists and even on the fringes of communist regimes, totalitarian uh, dictatorships, um, you know, America's not perfect, but man, we are a pretty amazing place. And I've been all over the world and I've seen it. So that's what that flag represents to me. And it represents tremendous um, sacrifice, you mm. know, since being in this country. It was individuals who were willing to step up and say, hey, I believe in that freedom and opportunity. I believe we should have that freedom and opportunity from the citizen soldiers who were willing to step up and, and fight the greatest um, uh, military power in the world at that time when we decided, hey, we're going to you know, fight England uh, for our own independence. All the way fast forward through the years where American citizens have been willing to step up against uh, you know, fascism and Nazis, Nazism and communism and now terrorism. Yeah. So that, that's what it represents. I've lost a lot of friends. I obviously almost lost my own life. So for me, um, it, it, that is what it represents. And, 
You know, I hope that people recognize that and understand that freedom is not a, uh, it's not a right. Um, it is a gift and it is something that must be preserved and nurtured and taken care of. And sometimes it even must be fought for. Uh, doing the unpopular thing to make sure that you preserve your freedom. So th those are the things that I see when I look at the flag, because it is the flag that uh, draped the caskets of my teammates when they came home. Mm. Man, I, I can't even imagine what that was like or what that experience was like. But Jason, you alluded to stepping up and how those individuals heard the call and, you know, they fought with valor and unfortunately lost their lives. That's what we celebrated yesterday on Memorial Day. Now, you too, to be a U.S. Navy SEAL, had to step up. You had to hear the call. So what made you want to be a Navy SEAL? You know, I was raised in a very patriotic family. I mean, a family of service, uh, you know, grew up to the stories of my grandfather, who was a decorated B-24 pilot in World War II, uh, earned numerous awards. Uh, my great uncle had been, uh, was killed in World War II. Hmm. Story. He was also a pilot shot down in the Pacific theater. Uh, my, um, my, my maternal grandfather actually had immigrated from France and he actually fought uh, with the French in World War II. So kind of this interesting blend of, of history within my family and military service. So as a young age, it was all I ever wanted to do. Um, my dad was in the army and had been an airborne rigger and, um, up until the early two thousands, the SEAL teams, we went through army airborne school, including me. I went through army airborne school in 1996. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, my dad told me about the SEAL teams when I was probably, I don't know, 14 years old. And, uh, it just piqued my interest. And the little bit of information I could find was one, very secretive. Uh, couldn't find out much about these guys, but the recurring theme I kept hearing was, you know, best of the best, toughest training in the U.S. military. And I don't know what about that that piqued my interest because I wasn't <laughs> this super hard charging kid back then. I was probably a little more enamored with just the military and special operations, but I said, hey, that's what I want to do. And I set my sight on that and never looked back. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of hopefuls out there who think that they can do it. They're probably a little too old and, you know, they're, you're not going to put their pride on the line to actually go out and try it. Uh, but a lot of us out there have probably watched Bud's Class 234 on YouTube. And that's really the only class that was, you know, aired online for people to watch and kind of get some sort of insight on what it's like to be a Navy SEAL or the training that goes in through Bud's. So as somebody who went through Bud's through the Hell Week that everybody knows and recognizes, what makes somebody successful from being unsuccessful? Um, so the majority of buds is mindset. I mean, you know, your podcast talks about it. Um, mm -hmm. it, it really is that, that mindset that you had the ability to endure extreme discomfort and, and a little bit of pain. And, uh, in this, um, this world that is perfectly designed to be as unfair as possible. They will tell you all the rules and you will follow the rules and then you will be punished because you followed the rules. <laughs> um, you know, and that's a very succinct explanation, but they'll tell you to get something done in a minute. You'll get it done in 50 seconds and you'll be failed because you didn't do it fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll be told you have 45 seconds when you made it in 50 seconds the last time. So it, it's just this crazy, dichotomy there's a very uh well-planned method to the madness and the madness is this that in combat things frequently do not go according to plan and we need individuals that have the ability to think through that chaos to think through that pain and misery and still be optimistic and hopeful and still bring guys together to be able to accomplish very challenging strategic tactical operational level missions so that's what training is designed to do um, so uh, what makes the difference between people that make it and people that don't? Uh, I think a combination, uh, I, I talk to people, three rules to make it through SEAL training. I mean, rule number one is the one that the vast majority of people violate, and that is you cannot quit. You cannot ring that bell. Um, it is the hmm. fundamental rule of going through SEAL training. If you ring the bell, you guarantee failure. 
Um, you cannot control all the external factors that come along with training. Um, you know, unfortunately, it is very hard on your body and a lot of guys get hurt. Mm -hmm. So you can't control that. You can do your best, but sometimes guys get hurt and put out of training. Sometimes guys have whatever other medical issues. Sometimes it's a performance issue, but whatever it is, uh, those are the things that you have less control over. The one thing you truly have control over is whether you ring that bell or not. And uh, I, I tell guys over and over again, don't ever ring the bell. And you get a lot of guys that show up with a lot of bravado. I mean, I have guys on my social media all the time. You know, I'm going to be a SEAL. I'll never quit. And uh, most of those guys will quit. That's the reality. Uh, right. You know, we have a 75% attrition rate and the vast majority of people quit. Just because they, for whatever reason, you know, in their minds, they doubt themselves. They're unwilling to be able to deal with that adversity. Mm -hmm. Rule number two is don't mentally quit. And mentally quitting is what starts to happen before you commit to physically quitting. Um, you start to doubt yourself. You start to doubt your ability to endure. Um, you start to think of other options besides, you know, hey, maybe going out and being in the regular Navy would be okay. Uh, that doesn't sound so bad as opposed to, you know, getting my ass kicked and freezing my ass <laughs> off and in this water being screamed at 24 seven, knowing that I still have six more months of this, whatever it is, you know, that is a very dangerous road to move down of, of mentally quitting and mentally quitting almost always leads to physically quitting. Mm. Um, you know, and then the last one is that thing that I talked about at the beginning training is unequivocally not fair. It's designed to be that way. And, and, uh, all through training, it will be that way. And the guys who can't get past that, the longer they're there, the more they get bitter about the fact, hey, I'm doing everything right. Yeah. So if you can follow those three rules, if you can accept with a smile on your face that it's always going to be unfair, that they're always going to tell you this is the mark that you have to meet. And, uh, and you can't slack off and say, well, I know I'm going to fail anyway, so I'm only going to half-ass it. Oh, no, you will get <laughs> crushed for that. Right. So it, it really is, a, it is designed to, to break you mentally, physically, emotionally, uh, and then show you that you still have the ability to go further. So if you can follow all those things, then you up your chances of graduation by about 80%. But there's still luck still plays a part for everybody. And, you know, so the yeah. only thing you can do is mentally prepare. But uh, it is it is 90 percent mental and 10 percent physical. Oh, I love that. So what if you can't swim? What if you need to use floaties? Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, the, the interesting thing about that is uh, uh, I actually have a friend who's no longer with us that showed up to Bud's and uh, he was not a very good swimmer. Mm hmm. Um, and I'll be honest, I wasn't a very good swimmer. I, 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 I was, a, well, that's not true. I was a good swimmer. I wasn't a fast swimmer. Oh, okay. uh, and that hurt me a lot in training. I, I ended up having to really work hard. I was a great runner. I was strong, uh, you know, for my body size, but I was not the greatest swimmer. So the bottom line is if you are committed, um, you know, if you have the mental commitment, you can overcome some of the, the drawbacks, uh, or you can overcome some of your weaknesses. Life is no different. If you're willing to work hard enough and grind through the misery and pain, because if you're not good at something there, training's designed to be miserable as it is, <laughs> even if you're phenomenal at it. So if you suck at it, it will be <laughs> 10 times more miserable. For you. Absolutely. So you just talked about how training sucks. Well, I want to pull up something on your website. I want to tell you or ask you whether or not you agree with me or not, or who wrote this, or if you wrote it or somebody else wrote it for you. You talked about you enjoyed a full year of friendly instructors, relaxing times on the beach, and endless nights under the Coronado moon before graduating class. Was that something you wrote, or did somebody just, were you just in a good mood that day? Uh, I wrote it. I'm the king of sarcasm. Uh, so I like to uh, throw out the sarcastic wit. And uh, yeah, you know, the funny thing is about training. I mean, I've been through SEAL training. I've been through Ranger school. And yes, they're designed to suck. But what you learn about yourself, and, and there's all these funny moments that will occur when the suck factor is high, especially if you're around the right people. Mm -hmm. um, the right people who begin to embrace the idea that, you know, you, the only way to end this, if you're not going to quit, is to make it to the other side. And you don't know where the other side is. 
So you have to just get this very dark sense of humor. You have to be able to laugh in the face of pain and misery. And, uh, and, and when you do that, it makes for interesting times. It makes for funny times. You know, you're around guys who are cracking jokes when the vast majority of people in this world would not be because it's human nature to look inward when we're, when we're struggling, when we're in pain, when we're super uncomfortable. Um, it's just natural human beings turn inward. I mean, yesterday doing the Murph, Ray and I were joking when we got to the second part of the run, there wasn't much talking going on, man. <laughs> we were huffing and puffing and we were hurting. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just natural. That's human nature. So that's the fun thing that if you can laugh, if, and that's what I miss the most about the SEAL teams for anybody out there, if you get into a military unit, it is uh, especially a frontline combat military unit where you're doing hard things. Uh, it is the camaraderie, the shenanigans that you will miss the most because most people out in the world don't see it that way. Yeah, absolutely. You and Ray have a podcast, don't you? We do the Overcome and Conquer show. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Kind of what that's about? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Ray and I went through SEAL training together. We were actually in the same boat crew. We went through Hell Week together. And, uh, you know, but we grew up and had different paths. Uh, Ray left the SEAL teams and went on to do uh, different various forms of government contracting around the world. Still, you know, seeing a lot of combat and doing a lot of things. And I grew up and uh, ended up, you know, getting a commission and going down the officer road. So we took different paths, um, but the SEAL mindset is the same. And we both have this idea of, you know, having this relentless overcome mindset and continue to grind forward no matter what. My motto is overcome, Ray's motto is conquer. So it just became this uh, great blend of, uh, of uh, ideas and we wanted to add people on who could speak to that mindset so that's what we do we have amazing guests on that talk about the overcome and conquer mindset we've had a lot of seals uh we've had other amazing individuals and it is uh it's a show for those out there that are looking to become the best version of themselves so you can find it on all the major podcast platforms uh itunes is probably the biggest one people listen to us but uh check it out overcome and conquer show awesome i love that that just gave me goosebumps that i'm gonna have to I, I'm gonna have to subscribe and, uh, you know, make sure we share that too uh, on our episode after this as well. Awesome, Jason. Uh, well, you, we talk about overcome and conquer, or you just talked about overcome and conquer. And that's what your podcast is predicated around. I know that's how you live your life as well moving forward. You had to overcome and conquer a pretty sticky situation that I talked about in 2007, uh, where, where you almost lost your life, where you were shot multiple times in the arm, you were shot once in the face. And then in your book and even on your website, you talk about how two of your team members went down alongside you during that moment of time. So do you care to expect, like, why don't you paint the picture for us? Tell us what happened. Tell us about the HVT to, to the extent that you can and that experience you were going through at the time. Yeah, so uh, Fallujah or the Al Anbar province of Iraq in 2007, we were operating out of Fallujah, which was still pretty volatile spot, definitely the, the heart of the Al Qaeda um, insurgency really was basing itself out of Fallujah up until the, the, the first battle of Fallujah in 2004. There was another big push into, to, into Fallujah in 2006 uh, with the Anbar awakening and that drove some of the heart of Al Qaeda a little bit up in you know, northeast of Fallujah. And we were there during that time, a time in the war called the Anbar awakening. Uh, and this occurred in coordination with the surge and a whole lot of other things. But uh, for special operations, I mean, 2006, 2007, probably saw some of the heaviest fighting in Iraq. Uh, a lot of the guys that I know, we, we had a lot of deaths. We had a lot of injuries across the military. Um, so pretty, pretty volatile time. And we got there in the spring of 2007 and just started um, – you know, everything you ever trained to do as a SEAL. We were going out almost every night conducting high level, uh, what we call capture kill missions. So either going after mid-level to high level uh, insurgent or, uh, or Al Qaeda leaders uh, with the intent to either capture or kill them. And um, so very, very successful deployment, a very um, action packed deployment. Mm -hmm. And there was one individual we were looking for the entire deployment on the very first mission of our deployment. Uh, uh, it was a turnover op with another team. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, a new book will be coming out soon called Perfectly Wounded. It's available for pre-sale now about a SEAL by the name of Mike Gay. Hmm. And Mike was on that mission, our very first mission. I actually wasn't on it because uh, not everybody from both team was on it. It was kind of a kind of a merging of different team, you know, elements that were going together on this mission. But on that mission, it, uh, they were going after this very high level leader and they stepped into a pretty volatile, bad situation. Um, multiple people got shot up, including Mike Day. Uh, hmm. one of, um, one of their guys was killed, Petty Officer Clark Schwedler. So a SEAL was killed. Um, and Iraqi was killed and it really was kind of the eye opener for us. Hey, welcome to Iraq. Right. Um, but we wanted that guy. We hunted him all deployment, this high level leader. So fast forward to the end of the deployment, uh, September of 2007, you know, we got word that that individual was going to be in a specific time and location. We launched on this mission and, um, to make a, a long story short, we basically, um, we basically walked into a very well executed ambush. So that individual was at the target that we were moving to. Uh, he had a pre staged ambush line with his security detail in front of the house as we were maneuvering up on it. Uh, and my team and I walked into that ambush. And uh, uh, myself, several team members were shot in the initial engagement. Um, you know, boom, very PK machine gun is a large belt fed weapon that shoots a bullet about the size of my thumb. Um, uh, so my medic was hit, almost took his leg off. Another one of our guys took three rounds. Uh, I took multiple rounds in the body armor and the arm took a round in the face and just, it turned into a very bad, um, crossfire situation where our guys were pinned behind the, the only point of cover we had cover being something that'll stop bullets which was kind of a large John Deere style tractor tire. Our guys were back behind that shooting, uh, our wounded guys, and then uh, two additional guys who uh, had not been wounded and who were basically shooting and biting. And then I had been hit and was out front at this point, pinned down in between the tire and the enemy fighters. And uh, just, it was about a, um, we estimate anywhere from 35 to 40 minute firefight, but a very vicious, like very intense. Mm. Um, I know some guys that have been firefights that have lasted, you know, 24, 48 hours, but they're very sporadic. You right. know, there's a few shots here and then maybe an hour or two will go by. Uh, this was a nonstop gunfire ambush that lasted fully. You know, we were, we were running out of ammo at the end. And, uh, and that's exactly what my team leader talked about. But thankfully, we ended up calling fire directly on our position from a uh, AC-130 gunship that was up overhead, ended up being the closest fire mission in the entire Iraq war, mm. and uh, saved our lives and got us out of there. My team leader ran forward, got me, uh, saved my life, and uh, we managed to, managed to get out of there. But uh, obviously, that started a whole new journey of getting put back together for me and, you know, ended my operational career with the damage I took to my body. Oh, man, I can't, I can't even imagine. And talk about a once in a lifetime experience. And, you know, by the grace of God, you're here talking to us today. And that's, you know, that's very powerful, Jason. My next question for you, what is that like? You know, you're bleeding out in the battlefield. And, you know, you're just seeing your life literally flash before your eyes. And you hear that gunship come in over you and you hear those rounds start to hit the ground. What is going through your mind when that was going on? Uh, you know, uh, freedom, you know, I mean, and I mean, it sounds a little cliche to say that, but I mean, it's like, okay, hope, I guess is probably a better word. Um, you know, combat is a incredibly intense situation. And when you were on the ground, uh, in an intense firefight, um, you know, the biggest, one of the things that makes the United States so effective in combat is our ability to, to bring all these different assets together. So obviously, you know, SEALs and special operations guys are well-trained, but you're limited by, you know, the amount of ammunition you can carry. Um, the biggest gun we have is obviously these aircraft in the sky mm. and our ability to deliver precision munitions when we need it. Um, if they can't get on station or whatever reason they can't come in there, unfortunately, there's been a lot of lives lost because, you know, they couldn't get air support or whatever it was. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, I'd been in other 
pretty big firefights. Um, it, uh, it seems like a long time. Like if you ever watch the movie, um, 13 hours. Oh yeah. I've seen that one. uh, My heart went out for those guys because they do a good job in the movie. And I remember hearing about it in real life. I mean, it is an eternity when you're in an intense firefight that you are waiting for air support to get on station. Um, because it really is the great equalizer. It is the thing that can enable you to get out of there alive. So when, uh, when I was laying there and confronting the very, the very fact that I may not make it out of there alive, uh, when that gunship, when my team leader called out, hey, incoming fire missions, I was like, dude, all right, we, we can get out of here. So it was like hope. So mm-hmm. it is, uh, it's an incredible um, feeling. It's an awe-inspiring feeling. It was incredible to... <laughs> To have this front row seat to be laying there, even as messed up as I was, uh, to literally, and it, and it literally, we literally called these rounds directly on our position. And we're very fortunate that we didn't get wounded um, uh, by our own rounds, which is obviously the danger of what we call danger close fire missions. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I remember the rounds impacting in front of me and blowing up and going over me. I remember hearing the enemy get hit and calling out in pain. Um, and I remember thinking, man, we might actually get out of here. Wow. That's, oh my God. And that's giving me chills, Jason, <laughs> because, you know, you got to experience it, but all of us don't. And that kind of segues me to my, my next question for you is, uh, you know, you've been through it. You've seen it. You've seen death. You've seen dying. You've seen destruction. You've seen just utter chaos. But on the other side of the world, while this is going on, we don't get to see that. We only get to hear it. So we're going off of what we hear. And that documentary series that I alluded to called Warfighters, great series on the History Channel. It talks about your battle of Fallujah and lots of other battles that are the untold stories of those battles that we don't hear all the time. Operation Red Wings being one of those, uh, which the famous movie that came out, uh, you, you know, with uh, Mark Wahlberg and talking about Michael Murphy too. Uh, but all of those missions, while those were going on, it seemed just to be a constant uphill battle or there just seemed to be some type of ambush that came up. It always seemed like the enemy had the advantage. Did you always feel like as an officer that you were fighting an uphill battle or did you ever feel like you had the competitive edge? No, we always had the competitive edge. The thing is in a lot of these the thing, you know, the things that you see in movies and TV typically um, are when things have gone wrong. And unfortunately, in combat, when things go wrong, they go wrong very quickly and they go wrong in a catastrophic manner. Um, you know, and, and usually it's a series of, you know, you know, could it have been a mistake or could it have just been a bad situation? But usually there's a compound effect that picks up speed. And unfortunately, that's what happened in our firefight. That's exactly what happened uh, in Operation Red Wings. It's obviously what happened with the downing of Extortion uh, 17. So all these things in any combat where there's, you know, catastrophic injuries. I mean, there's just combat. um, You know, here's the interesting thing about combat. A 12-year-old kid with an AK-47 can throw his, his rifle over the wall and pull the trigger without ever looking and that bullet he sends downrange can kill you just as quickly as a 30-year experienced sniper who <laughs> cracked off a shot through a scope at you. You know, combat can be unpredictable. You can do everything possible to try and protect, protect yourself or, you know, all your tactics can be perfect. And sometimes things go uh, not according to plan. And, you know, it just is what it is. So, no, we definitely stack the deck in our favor. Mm-hmm. I'll be honest, you know, what, what you see in these movie, in movies and what you see in the show SEAL teams is a very dra- uh, uh, dramatic version of the most um, exciting moments of combat. Oftentimes combat wasn't always so intensely exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, there was always a high potential for something to go wrong, but you know, we, we didn't get into firefights every single night. As a matter of fact, a perfect mission for us, and it frequently happened, is we would sneak in uh, to a bad guy's house, and we would have them wrapped up in their sleep. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they would literally wake up with, you know, uh, you know, kitted up dudes with green eyes, and <laughs> usually a muzzle strike to the face. And they would be wrapped up and they'd be off that target before they ever knew what hit them. 
and, uh, right. and not a shot was fired. And that's how, um, you know, that's how we want it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I think people out there think, oh man, you know, it should be these glorious firefights every time. Well, the problem with that is, you know, these glorious firefights, uh, other bad guys shoot back and those bullets can hit people. So, you know, you hope they don't, uh, hit you, but that's just kind of part of how it goes. So, so I wouldn't say that I, people are seeing when things go really wrong and when things re go really wrong, they go really wrong. Right. And unfortunately, bad things happen and people die. But the flip side of that coin is people do amazing things when things go really wrong. I mean, you look at, mm. you know, lone survivor story, you look at uh, my story and what my guys did, you know, what my teammates did to fight back and save my life, what that AC 130 crew did. So, um, yeah, I would never think that I would, you know, we, we definitely, the American military does a pretty darn good job of stacking the deck in our favor. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Well, Jason, while you were, so once you were shot, we talked about, you know, the, the numerous amount of surgeries that you had to be able to recover. And if you don't know a lot about Jason, you need to go look this up online. And I'm about to pull this up right now and read it verbatim because, man, this, this gave me chills to my core. Uh, you wrote, you put, while you were in your room recovering, you put a orange letter on your door. And the orange letter that gained national recognition, especially at the time for President George W. Bush, read, hang on, here it is, is attention to all who enter here. If you are coming into this room with sorrow or to feel sorry for my wounds, go elsewhere. The wounds I received, I got in the job I love, doing it for people I love, supporting the freedom of a country I deeply love. I am incredibly tough and will make a full recovery. A recovery. What is full? That is the absolute utmost physically my body has the ability to recover. I will push that about 20% further through sheer mental tenacity. This room you are about to enter is a room of fun, optimism, and intense, rapid regrowth. If you are not prepared for that, go elsewhere from the management. So what, holy crap, like that is unbelievable. What brought you to that point of wanting to write that? You know, I think it's a little bit of uh, what brought me to that point is uh, I had some individuals that came into the room. One, I'd been inundated with a lot of negative um, information. I think when things go wrong in your life, it just is what it is. You're, you're, we're all inundated with a lot of negative information. I mean, you look at this pandemic. There's a lot of people that are struggling right now, businesses that are struggling. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling it myself. The event industry is totally dried up. So uh, I'm, mm. I'm not speaking right now. So there's a lot of people that are feeling that. And there's a natural tendency when you're inundated with negative information to just start to focus. And, you know, they call it ruminating on that, that negativity. When the doctors are telling me all this negative stuff, um, you know, hey, we're going to have to potentially amputate your arm. You have no use of your left hand. I mean, I hadn't seen myself. And I'll be honest, I was kind of afraid to look at myself. I had tubes coming out of every orifice. And mm -hmm. um, to compound this, I had some individuals that had come into the room that were talking to me. Um, the doctors and nurses came back in and those individuals started to have a conversation to themselves and I could overhear some of the things they were saying. And they were saying, you know, what a shame, what a pity, you know, we send these young men and women off to war and they come home broken and battered and they're never going to be the same. And um, I just, I just remember thinking when they left that like, you know, is, is that me? Is this my future that I'm just going to be this broken like never going to be the same, um, you know, just this individual, you know, I mean, I almost, I, I thought of, am I going to be like the, um, you know, Gary Sinise's character and Forrest Gump, you know, <laughs> just broken, disgruntled veteran. Um, and I was like, no, you know, that's not me. Um, and, and there's some interesting things. I mean, my book, The Trident talks about this journey. Mm. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a man of faith. God, I think, sets you up for success and puts things in your path to prepare you for future hardship and future adversity. And uh, a lot of people, if you know my story, if you follow me, mm. um, but a lot of people don't know my story, don't know that I made some leadership mistakes when I was younger. 
uh, as a new officer. And those leadership mistakes almost got me kicked out of the SEAL teams. Um, and, um, and it was a long, hard journey to both humble myself and earn back a little bit of the trust and credibility I damaged from my own ego and arrogance. And that was a very long, hard road. Um, but I learned a lot about myself and I learned about grinding forward and I learned about, you know, little wins and all of that set me up for success that by the time I was wounded, I was like, you know what? I've been through worse because a lot of people think that my battlefield injuries were the worst thing that ever happened to me. It wasn't. It was the mistakes I made as a leader in that long, hard, dark road of climbing out of that hole to fix myself and to earn back uh, the respect of my teammates. Mm -hmm. So when I was laying in that house, hospital bed in that moment when they were, everybody was saying these negative things, I realized that it's one of the most powerful things you have. And it's, um, I, I talk about this in my TED talk called, um, you know, how to get through hard times. Um, you have a choice. You have a choice in how you're going to deal with negativity. You have a choice in how you're going to deal with adversity. Um, SEAL training had taught me that. And this Leadership failure had taught me that. And in that moment, I chose, hey, I'm going to drive forward. I'm going to grind. Uh, I don't care what people say. I'm going to choose positivity over negativity. And, you know, I'm going to figure out a new path forward. And that's how that sign came to be. So I'll be honest, it was a little bit of a, um, I don't know, it was a little bit of a positive statement that I made uh, that, hey, you know, I'm not going to feel sorry for myself. So nobody else is going to feel sorry for me either. But here's the amazing thing about choosing positivity in the face of negativity in incredibly hard situations. It's like throwing a rock into a still pond. It, it creates ripple effects that go out and start impacting all these people around you, waves breaking on the shore. And you never know the impact of that, you know, and it's something sometimes that you don't realize that people around you are going to feed off of and get amazing energy and inertia from. And that's exactly what happened with that sign. I mean, to this day, millions of people have been motivated and inspired by that sign. Um, obviously, you know, President Bush signed it. It now is framed. I don't, I didn't keep it. I donated it to the hospital. It now hangs in the wounded ward at Walter Reed. And I've, I've had, gosh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wounded warriors reach out to me and just say, hey, thank you, man. I really needed that, you know, before I was going to a surgery. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've had people that have been in grievous accidents, people with cancer, people struggling with failure and crisis reach out to me and say, hey, man, thanks for writing that sign. So, you know, it is the power of choice and choosing positivity in the face of negativity that can make the difference when you're going through those hard times. Absolutely. I love that. And positivity, I mean, I'm sure you can disagree with me if you, if you do, but positivity, it takes some time for others to catch along that maybe don't emulate that type of behavior. But when they catch on over time, everybody benefits from it. It just creates a conducive culture that just wants to train, wants to work out, wants to be better, wants to learn, wants to grow. And it just continues to, to thrive and thrive and thrive. And you know, it's awesome to hear you say that. And, you know, Jason, I want to ask you, you touched a little on, a bit on your book, The Trident, and how you talked about leadership and your mistakes from leadership. I work at the fire department. A lot of my following works at the fire department, but there's also a lot of people who follow this podcast who are CEOs, they're executives, they're entrepreneurs, they're leading from the front. I know there's a lot of takeaway of what you learned as a leader, but for officers, for leaders, for CEOs, executives, and entrepreneurs, what advice do you have for those types of individuals watching this? So, um, you know, I teach something I call the three rules of leadership and, uh, a, a lot of individuals, young leaders, I was guilty of this. Um, they have a natural tendency to think that leadership is your ability to get other people to do things, you know, to, to, you know, move a ship or move a, move a, uh, a, a company down the road, if you will, to achieve an objective. And, and that is a component of leadership, but really um, what they confuse is their ability to tell someone what to do versus your ability to inspire someone to want to do it. And uh, so, so, you know, a, a pivotal question I like to ask sometimes organizations is, or leaders, you know, do your people follow you because they want to or because they have to? Mm. Um, and that's really a pivotal question in leadership. Um, and it comes down to these three rules of leadership. The first rule is you've got to lead yourself. And that's rule number one. You've got to, um, 
set the example and build structure and discipline and have that positive mindset and do those things where people follow you because they, they want to, because uh, it's just a natural thing in, in humanity that if people are doing the right thing and they're setting the example and they're positive and they're doing the things that you want to do, um, they're going to naturally follow you. They just, right. whether they intend to or not, uh, it's just a natural, it's just how human beings work. The second part is you've got to lead others. And that's not telling others what to do. It's more of motivating and inspiring them to, uh, to accomplish their best versions of themselves. And then rule number three, you got to lead always. You can't pick and choose. This is one of the mistakes I made when I was a young leader. I was kind of, you know, hey, when it's time for me to be a leader, I want to be a leader. But when, it, uh, you know, when it's time for me to be off, I want to I wanna be a drunken idiot. Um, you know, leadership doesn't work that way. Know, you damage your credibility and credibility is the currency of leadership. Mm. So once you decide to put on the mantle of leadership, you're a leader at all times. You know, nobody, you don't walk down the street and, you know, run into some of the people you work with and, you know, they don't go, Hey, you know, this is my best friend, Jason. Oh, by the way, he's also my boss or the commanding officer of my company. Mm. Uh, leadership doesn't work that way. Um, so, that's where, you know, you have to make those hard decisions and you have to watch yourself and just know, hey, I'm a leader at all times. And, you know, I've got to, I've got to watch myself. I've got to watch what I say. I mean, even something as small as a, a disappointment on your face can have negative impacts on the people around you when you're a leader. So those are the things that I teach and, and, and those rules apply. I don't care if you're in the business world. I don't care if you're in the police department, fire department. Um, you know, corporate world, it doesn't matter. Uh, leadership is leadership across the board. Yeah, absolutely. Well said, Jason. So obviously you have the book, The Trident, and I'll make sure when I post this video on YouTube to link that book. Uh, so if you're watching this, uh, you can scroll below this video. Once you press subscribe and you can see uh, Jason's book that I'll link, The Trident, it's a great read. And I highly recommend that you look at it and read through it. Uh, that's on audiobook as well. Is that correct, Jason, or is it just on hard copy? Yep, audiobook and electronic. Okay, awesome. So you can get either one. It's really, it's not expensive. It's not going to drain your pockets, and it's just got an abundance of wealth and knowledge for you to be able to learn from and extract. So, Jason, you got the Trident, and I know you have speaking engagements that dried up just a little bit just because of the pandemic. Obviously, we're having to do this right now over Zoom because of COVID and respecting social distancing. We're way more than six feet apart. But what's next for you? What is your, what, what's your next couple of years look like or what's your plan? You know, I'm expanding my programs. Uh, speaking is, I love speaking. I love getting out there and trying to spread a positive message and help uh, companies, teams, and organizations. Um, um, Sorry, I had a pop-up window and I almost no, got, got cut off. So you're, you're good. No worries yeah. at all. So I, I love doing that, but what I'm starting to look at is how can I have a deeper impact on people? Um, and that is something I'm starting to look at in the personal coaching and consulting space. So developing programs for companies, systematic programs. I learned a lot in my special operations career um, on how we build very cohesive, effective, you know, high performing elite teams. So how do we take those principles and apply them into uh, business? Uh, how do we make effective leaders? People, uh, you know, people do things differently. We see the world differently. Ray and I are very different in our personalities, you know, right. my podcast host. Um, but how do you take people with different personalities and make sure you integrate them in your team, leveraging their great strengths and also minimizing their weaknesses, mm. you know? Um, so th those are the things we're applying. And I'm also looking at on the coaching side. Um, I am getting ready to launch a brand new program that specifically is targeting uh, police, fire and, and military veterans to help them be successful in the civilian world, because it is a different world. Mm. And I know there's a lot of us out there that kind of struggle, but we aspire once we decide we're going to leave, you know, public service or military service, we want to find that success in the civilian world, but it's hard. It's different. 
Um, you know, the world is different and, and, you know, I want to be able to teach guys how to get out there and find success, how to a still be a good, um, you know, if you are a parent, if you are a spouse, how to be a good spouse, you know, now that we're not doing all these other things we're doing, but also to build such structures so you can be successful. If you go down the entrepreneurial path or if you go down, you know, Hey, I'm going to go work for another company, whatever it is. So, uh, helping guys to find what is your passion? What is your purpose? What is your new mission? Uh, and how to build on that. So that's one of the new programs I'm getting ready to launch and I've been working on. Awesome. And I'll make sure to link all that information for people down in the video as well. Also give you an opportunity to tell or tell people where they can reach you on your social media. We're nearing the end of our podcast. I hate it because I love to ask you more questions, uh, but I want to be respectful of your time. I know you're a busy guy. I got a lot going on, but on a closing note, Jason, you provided a lot of awesome value today and I loved it. I know everybody watching this is going to love it too. But the floor is yours. Do you have anything on your heart that's lingering or do you have anything that you'd like to say to close this on up? You know, I, I would just say that uh, uh, nobody, you know, life is a journey and the leadership path is a journey. The entrepreneurial path is a journey. Um, and, and, you know, what you're seeing, the things that I talk about, the things in my book are, are successes that have been achieved and lessons that I've learned through a lot of <laughs> heartache and hardship. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm not perfect. You know, I still have my mistakes. I still have my problems. I still have negative moments. Um, but the difference is I continue to grind forward. And, uh, and, and, I, and I won't quit. I'll just keep going. And I think that's the difference in this life. I know um, I've had people that have reached out to me and said, you know, how do I achieve this level of, you know, I don't know, perfection, you know, where I'm always positive. I'm always this. I'm always that. Well, it doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> um, you know no, nobody is that way. It's just how it is. Life is, you know, we have highs and lows. We have ebbs and flows. We have positive times and we have negative times. The thing is that we constantly drive forward and we focus on just moving forward. I call it moving the needle. We are constantly moving the needle. And, and sometimes, you know, you're going to have these amazing days of incredible productivity where you're going to slam that needle. You know, you're going to redline it from your engine being just full throttle. And, uh, and other days, it's going to be a grind just to, you know, barely get that needle to bounce at all. But it doesn't right. matter as long as it's moving forward. And that's what you need to recognize. I think people think... You know, I've heard people say to me, oh, man, you're superhuman or, or, you know, they talk about Jocko. Jocko, Jocko actually is a robot. I'm convinced. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. I've known Jocko my entire career. I think if we cut him open, he wouldn't be real. He'd just, he's fake. Yeah. So, so throw <laughs> Jocko out. But the rest of us are human, man. And, uh, and, and that is the reality. So as long as you set those goals, as long as you go after them, recognize it's going to take longer than you think. Uh, and, and it will probably be harder. Um, and, and you're going to have down moments. You're going to have hard moments. I've had them. You're going to have your doubts. I mean, here I am, I'm a two-time author, um, you know, successful guy. But I, even I still have my doubts on getting out there on some of the things that I'm doing. So accept it as a part of life and don't let it slow you down, man. Don't get stuck on that X. Keep driving forward and I guarantee, you, you know, you will find success in your life too. Well said, sir. And Jason, thank you again for your time and just providing so much value today for all my listeners, which is probably not as big as you're falling, uh, but that's not what it's about. It's not a numbers game. It's just, you know, if we can help one person, then we're doing something right. So how do people get in contact with you if they have any more questions about your book or they just want to, you know, get involved with some of your programs? Yeah, you can go to jasonredman.com. That's my main website from there. You can go to my website, get off X. It's got my coaching uh, it's got my online store. If you'd like a signed copy of the Trident or Overcome, uh, that's where you can go. Make sure, though, please write in the comments if you want me to personalize it. Because uh, if you don't write, if you don't write anything, I don't personalize it because I don't know if you're giving it to. I don't know if it's for you. Maybe it's for your mom, your brother, your cousin. <laughs> I don't know. So I don't write a name in if there's no comments. Right. Um, and then also all my socials are on jasonredman.com. So if you want to follow me on social, I try to put out positive content on, you know, how to maintain that positive overcome mindset. Awesome. Well, Jason, thank you so much again. Uh, lastly, if you have, if you want to support this channel, continue to awesome get 
special guest interviews with Jason Redmond, military personnel, uh, professional athletes, so on and so forth. Like I said, you name it, we got it. That's my commitment to you. Press the subscribe button. It takes two seconds of your day. It's completely free. It helps this channel grow. And I want to continue to provide you awesome value that Jason provided you today. So I'm signing off, Jason. I'm going to press stop on the recording. I'm going to talk to you about a minute or so after we're done here. Uh, and then I'll let you go. But all of you watching this, thank you so much. I hope you're looking forward to JJ Berea's podcast with me here shortly and a lot of other awesome guests to come. We'll see you.